Good morning to everyone. I want to thank all the chairmen here and uh, to thank you, Dr. Lloret, because, well, he was the pioneer here in, the, in this kind of courses, uh, not so uh, years ago, not so many years ago. Okay, so our aim is to, to continue with his work here, so I'm very glad to be here. So it is for me a great honor to be the speaker of the first lecture of this course. It is our wish that this course will become one of the most interesting in the field of neuroanatomy and neurosurgery. There is a long tradition in organizing courses in neuroanatomy and workshops in neurosurgical approaches in the Department of Anatomy of this Faculty of Medicine. So I hope this course will be developed over many years. I will speak about the craniometric point of the skull in, and the brain cortical surface. Understanding the relationships of the sutures and the other superficial landmarks to the cortical surfaces is helpful in positioning and directing operative approaches. The positive contribution of the advanced technology to surgical outcome is undeniable. However, it is also undeniable that anatomical knowledge and 3D orientation are very important for successful surgical outcome. Another indication for the importance of anatomical knowledge is the fact that advanced technology is not always available. It is important to establish, to establish cortical, surface, uh, cortical key points to provide surgical anatomic framework for the placement of the craniotomies and to facilitate the main Schulze intraoperative identification. The correct ori orientation of the fourth neurosurgical approaches begins with the identification of surface landmarks known as craniometric points. These points, in addition to the main sutures, will define a framework on the skull for cranial approaches in the correct place. I will remember you the most important ones. First of all, from the frontal view, we can appreciate the nation, the bregma, and the frontosigomatic suture. The nation corresponds to the frontonasal suture and bregma to the intersection of the coronal and sagittal sutures. It is very important to know that the distance from the nation to the bregma is near 13 centimeters. From the upper view, we can identify the bregma, the coronal suture, the sagittal suture, and the lambdoid suture. The intersection of lambdoid and sagittal suture define the craniometric point called lambda. The lambda is located at an average distance of 25 centimeters posterior to nation and 13 centimeters posterior to bregma. From the lateral view of the skull, we can identify along the coronal suture three intersection points. The bregma, again, in the intersection with the sagittal suture, the stephanion in the intersection with the superior temporal line, and the terion that is located at the lateral end of the greater sphenoid wing, in the junction of the coronal, escamosal, sphenoparietal, and frontosphenoidal sutures. The lower end of the pars triangularis of the inferior frontal gyrus is located just under this craniometric point, as we will see in very few minutes. The frontosigomatic suture is situated on the lateral orbital rim. The frontosigomatic point is situated on the orbital rim 2.5 centimeters above the level of the sigomatic arch. The escamosal suture separates the temporal bone. It follows the anterior part of the posterior limb of the sylvian fissure before turning downward at the level of the postcentral gyrus to cross the junction of the middle and posterior third of the temporal lobe. The superior temporal line extends from the lateral frontal region across the parietal and temporal region to the upper margin of the mastoid. The coronal suture as it goes down from the sagittal suture, it crosses over the superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyri in front of the precentral sulcus. The central sulcus is nearer the lower than the upper part of the coronal suture because as it goes up, it's directed more posteriorly than coronal suture. 
In the posterior part of the skull, we must localize different craniometric points. In addition to the lambdoid suture and the lambda, we must know the inion, the opistocranion, the asterion, and the superior nuchal line. The lambda is the posterior point. Sorry, the lambda is the point where the sagittal suture and the lambda suture joins. The opistocranion corresponds to the most prominent occipital landmark. And the inion is the site of the bony prominence in the middle of the superior nuchal line. The lambda was found to be two or four centimeters superior to the opistocranion. And the inion is located between eight and six centimeters inferior to the lambda. The musculus semispinalis capitus inserts in, in the superior nuchal line. The transverse sinus underlies, in most cases, this line. As long as the neurosurgeon stays usually at least five millimeters below the insertion of the muscle, the transverse sinus will be avoided. Also, if the neurosurgeon sees the inion, we should be aware that majority of the turcular aerophily will be located superior to this point. So, the superior nuchal line provides an excellent landmark to know the intracranial location of the medial transverse sinus in the majority of cases. The turcular aerophily is situated between 5 and 10 millimeters superior to the inion. Only in the patients with Dandy Walker or Chiari malformation, particularly in type 2, these landmarks are not uh, optimal. The lambda suture provides a rough orientation of the, of the junction of occipital lobe posteriorly with the parietal temporal lobe anteriorly. The asterion is defined as the junction of the landoid, parietomastoid, and occipitomastoid sutures. It is also known as the Mercedes point because it is similar to the Mercedes Benz logo. This craniometric point has been used as an important landmark for approaches to the posterolateral cranial base, but in several studies it has been demonstrated that the relationship of the asterion and the transverse sinus is very variable. Only in 60% of patients uh, the transverse sinus is just under the asterion. Using the method of Roton, positioning the bar hole away from the asterion reduces the risk of bleeding. He describes the method as positioning the hole two centimeters below the asterion and one centimeter behind and less than one centimeter in front of the occipitomastoid suture. It may be helpful, it may be helpful to know several important landmarks on the skull be before applying the drapes. Sites commonly marked include the coronal and the sagittal suture, the central sulcus, the sylvian fissure, and the terion, inion, and asterion. Approximating the site of the sylvian fissure and central sulcus on the skull begins with noting the position of the nation, inion, and frontosigromatic point. The next step is to construct a line along the sagittal suture to determine the distance from the nation to the inion and mark the midpoint and the three-quarter point. The sylvian fissure is located along a line that extends backward from the frontosigomatic point across the lateral surface of the head to the three-quarter point of the nation to inion mid-sagittal line. The terion is located three centimeters behind the frontosigomatic point on the sylvian fissure line. The central sulcus is located by identifying the superior and inferior rolandic points. That corresponds to the upper on the lower ends of the central sulcus, as we will see in very few minutes. The superior rolandic point, so, is, it is located five centimeters behind the bregma, so it means that the central sulcus begins just there. A line connecting the superior rolandic point and the inferior rolandic point approximates the central sulcus. The lower rolandic point is situated 2.5 centimeters behind the terion on the sylvian fissure line. A proper craniotomy for a brain lesion and correct interpretation of the gyral structures under the craniotomy site is one of the most important steps in a successful surgery. There are very few persistent sulci in the brain that are always present in every individual. Therefore, identification of gyral structures may not be easy. To identify these structures, the use of bone landmarks of the cranium is extremely beneficial. <laughs> 
One end of the precentral and postcentral gyri is in the interhemispheric suture, and the other end is in the, is in the sylvian fissure. The precentral gyrus is located 4.5 centimeters behind the brema on the midline. On the lateral surface, the gyrus is only 2.5 centimeters behind the estephanion, so a craniotomy closer to the midline will be have a different motor and sensorial cortex uh, orientation from that of a craniotomy closer to the sylvian fissure. The postcentral gyrus is located 6.5 centimeters behind the bregma on the midline and 4 centimeters behind the stephanion. The sylvian fissure is a very important corridor for neurosurgical approaches. The anterior and ascending rami are of great importance in defining the inferior frontal gyrus and the posterior rami are important in defining the supramarginalis gyrus. No sulcal structures exist that will help in defining the angular and the supramarginalis gyri. So if the posterior ramus of the sylvian fissure is not observed in the craniotomy area, it is important to know that the area behind the external ear canal is where the supramarginalis gyrus and the angular gyrus are located. A wide opening of the sylvian fissure is recommended for many neurosurgical approaches. You should keep in mind that all the important cortical areas such as the Broca, Bernicke, motor and sensory cortex and the Hessel gyrus are around the sylvian fissure. The calcarine sulcus is located three or four centimeters below the lambda, approximately where the parieto-occipital sulcus arrives to the occipital external fissure. And because of its proximity the, to the confluence of sinuses, it can easily be recognized during the surgery. And now I will speak about the microsurgical sulcal key points. I will describe 10 sulcal key points and their correspondence with the craniometric points. The frontotemporal craniotomies are based in the pterional craniotomies described by Jasser Hill and probably constitute the most commonly mm, neurosurgical procedure. The frontal and temporal sulci and gyre can be estimated through the identification of the anterior sylvian point, the inferior rolandic point, and the inferior frontal sulcus and precentral sulcus meeting point. The constant location and cisternal aspect of the sylvian point indicate that it can be used not only as a starting site to open the sylvian fissure, but also as an initial landmark to identify other important uh, structures along the uh, fissure. The sylvian fissure is divided into a proximal segment and a distal segment, and they are separated by the sylvian point. The anterior sylvian point is an enlargement of the sylvian fissure, just inferior to the triangular part of the anterior and anterior to the, uh, to the opercular part of the inferior frontal gyrus, and is the best starting point for the sylvian fissure opening. The superior and inferior, sorry, the anterior sylvian point can usually be recognized because it has a cisternal aspect and a constant location. The superior and inferior margin of the sylvian fissure constitute the frontoparietal and temporal operculi, which cover the superior and inferior aspects of the insula. Operculum is a Latin word that means cover or top. We must identify the orbital part of the inferior frontal gyrus. After that, we must identify the suprasylvian structures. They must be understood as a series of V and U shaped gyri. The first one corresponds to the triangular part of the inferior frontal gyrus. The most anterior U is the opercular part of the inferior frontal gyrus, just beside the precentral sulcus. Together, the triangular and opercular part of the inferior frontal gyrus may constitute the motor speech area of Broca in the dominant hemisphere. So the inferior frontal gyrus is formed by pars orbitalis, pars triangularis, and pars opercularis. The next U is called the subcentral gyrus, Rolandic operculum, or the classical inferior, inferior frontoparietal please the passage of Broca. Just below, the inferior Rolandic point is located. The third U is composed of the arm connecting the postcentral and supramarginalis gyrus. And the C-shaped 
convolution that complex the supracilian operculum is formed by the supramarginalis gyrus and the end of the superior temporal gyri. The inferior margin of the sylvian fissure is in relation only to the superior temporal gyrus and is the temporal operculum. The opening of the fissure at the level of the anterior sylvian point shows very soon the insular apex, as you can see. The limen insula and the middle cerebral artery bifurcation are a little bit deeper and one or two centimeters anteriorly. The opening of the sylvian fissure exposes posteriorly to the anterior sylvian point the insula and opening anteriorly leads to the supracellular systems. It is important to know the distance between the anterior sylvian point and the inferior rolandic point along the sylvian fissure to control the situation of the central sulcus over the sylvian fissure. This distance is 2.3 centimeters more or less. The relation of the anterior sylvian point with the external cranial surface is in the area called anterior, anterior escamous point and is the area located on the most anterior segment of the escamous suture just posterior to the terion. The next point to explain is the inferior rolandic point. The central sulcus inferior extremity and the intersection with the sylvian fissure has been studied as a sulcal key point, the inferior rolandic point. This point is situated between 2 and 2.5 centimeters posterior to the anterior sylvian point, uh, as we have already said. Considering that inferior rolandic point indicates the position of the Hessel gyrus, removal of the superior and middle temporal gyri posterior to this point in the dominant hemisphere has a high risk of permanent dysphasia because it corresponds to the vernic area. In relation with the cranium, the inferior rolandic point lies underneath the area of intersection of the escamoid shooter with the vertical line coming from the preauricular depression, just in front of the tragus. This site corresponds in all cases to the higher segment of the escamoid shooter called superior escamoid point. The average vertical height of this segment is 4 centimeters. It's external uh, and it's, uh, it can, this can be, uh, we can take these four centimeters to estimate the, his external position. Recently, Roton has mentioned that the inferior rolandic point is 2.5 centimeters posterior to the terion on the sylvian fissure line. The next point is this. The inferior frontal sulcus and precentral sulcus meeting point. The inferior frontal sulcus come and in connection with the precentral sulcus or very, very close to it. This point is situated in, the co in, in this connection site. It is a very practical point because it can localize the precentral gyrus in the inferior third level, which corresponds to the face motor activation area and indicates the posterior and superior limits of the inferior frontal gyrus opercular part. As we already know, the Stefanion is the craniometric point at the level of the intersection of the coronal suture and the superior temporal line. Normally, the inferior frontal sulcus and precentral sulcus meeting point it lies around one or two centimeters posterior to this area. The three frontotemporal key points are, imp are important landmarks for estimating Broca's area in the dominant hemisphere. This is a reconstruction with Osiris for the frontotemporal key points. With this image, you can see the three points. If we cut in a coronal way at the level of the anterior sylvian point, we can see the deeper uh, areas that are the insula, the ventricle, and the putamen. The sulcal key points for the superfrontal and central areas are the superior frontal and precentral sulcus meeting point and the superior rolandic point. The superior frontal and presental meeting point. The superior frontal sulcus is constant and has a good relationship with the underlying ventricular frontal horn. It is an important neurosurgical corridor. Its posterior extremity, which usually lies very close to the precentral sulcus, 
is an important key point that limits anteriorly the precentral gyrus at the level of the hand motor activation area and limits posteriorly to the superior frontal sulcus opening. Anterior to this point, the superior frontal sulcus is always parallel to the interhemispheric and is usually a continuous segment. The superior frontal sulcus and precentral sulcus meeting point is an important microsurgical landmark because it is coronally related with the superior surface of the thalamus and with the floor of the lateral ventricle body, just behind the foramen of Monroe. As you can see in this reconstruction, more or less, in the MRI of this specimen, we can find the thalamus and the frontal horn and the relationship with the sulcal, this sulcal key point. This key point corresponds to the posterior coronal point. It is the cranial area located three centimeters lateral to the sagittal suture and one centimeter posterior to the coronal suture. The hand motor cortex is located just here. The superior rolandic point, is the next point, corresponds to the central sulcus and interhemispheric fissure intersection. It is located underneath the cranial site five centimeters posterior to the bregma. The craniometric point that corresponds to this sulcus key point is the superior sagittal point. This sulcal key point is used for central craniotomies for the exposure of the precentral and postcentral gyri, <coughs> the cingulate gyrus and the corpus callosum. Again, the reconstruction with the Osiris, where you can see the relation of the superior Rolandic point with deep structures. Let's see a practical case. This is a 63 years old man with a history of weakness in the right leg with progressive difficulty to walk during the last two months. In this MRI, we can see a tumor in the superior parietal lobe just behind the postcentral gyrus. If we take the superior Rolandic point as a sulcal landmark, the tumor is situated just one or two centimeters posterior to this area. Before dressing with drapes, we can draw on the scalp the craniometric points and the superior Rolandic point. We draw the coronal suture and the sagittal suture. Five centimeters posterior to the bregma, the superior Rolandic point is situated. Just one centimeter posterior to the tumor is supposed to me to be. We prepare for craniotomy, and we see that the tumor was just there. We made a complete resection of the high-grade glioma with, Florence, uh, with the Florence technique. The next group of key points is the parietal with the intraparietal and postcentral meeting point and the external occipital fissure medial point and the last time, the Eurion. The parietal craniotomies should have as, la as main landmarks these three sulcal key points. The exposure of the superior parietal lobule also requires the knowledge that the superior landic point lies underneath the cranial point located five centimeters behind the bregma, as you already know. The intraparietal sulcus is a continuous or interrupted sulcus, usually parallel to, to the interhemispheric fissure and separating the superior from the inferior parietal lobules. Anteriorly is related with the postcentral sulcus and posteriorly is usually continuous with the transverse occipital sulcus. The intraparietal sulcus is usually continuous with the postcentral sul sulcus. It is an important key point because it is an evident point that limits posteriorly the postcentral gyrus it can be used as a safe starting point for the microsurgical opening of this sulci, and it has a deep relationship with the ventricular trigon. This key point should be located underneath the cranial area six centimeters anterior to the lambda and five centimeters lateral to the sagittal suture. Exactly at this point, the name of this is the intraparietal point. In this image, that is a reconstruction with Osiris, we can see the relation of the intraparietal sulcus and posterior, posterior central sulcus meeting point with the ventricle and the trigon in the deep side. In this case, I present a 30-year-old woman with a history of mastectomy 
for a breast inflammatory cancer two years before. She had a fit and came to hospital. She was diagnosed of brain metastasis of the breast cancer. She underwent for resection a few days uh, later. The preoperative MRI scan saw a tumor in the right parietal level just posterior to the precentral sulcus in the intraparietal sulcus. In a semi-sitting position for a right parietal craniotomy and before the drapes, we must localize the intraparietal point. As we have seen in the MRI scan, the tumor is just here. After the palpation of the landoid suture and the sagittal suture, we mark the point 6 cm anterior to the landoid suture and 5 cm lateral to the sagittal one. The tumor is just 1 cm posterior. This is the craniotomy exposure an opening of the anterior part of the intraparietal sulcus just posterior to the uh, postcentral sulcus and intraparietal sulcus meeting point. After the corticectomy, we found a solid tumor and we proceeded to the complete resection. Here we show the postoperative axial and coronal MRI indicating the complete resection of the tumor. Three weeks later, later she underwent for tumor bed radiosurgery. We didn't use any neuronavigation. It is not necessary for easy cases if we use the craniometric, the, the craniometric points framework, it could be enough. The next point is the external occipital fissure medial point. The external occipital fissure corresponds to the extension of the medial parieto occipital sulcus into the brain convexity. It is usually a deep transversal sulcus on the medial side of each hemisphere. Its most medial point is a useful surgical landmark because it defines the sulcus position and the posterior aspect of the precuneus along the interhemispheric fissure. This sulcal K point lies underneath each paramedian area corresponding to the angle between the sagittal and the lambdoid sutures. The position of the lambda craniometric point in adults can be estimated from other craniometric points in the midline. As you already know, it is 25 centimeters posterior to the nation and 13 centimeters posterior to the bregma. And it is also 3 centimeters superior to the opistocranion. In this picture, you can appreciate the parieto occipital sulcus and the calcarine sulcus. With that, we can make a di the division of the medial surface areas and gyri, and we are able to distinguish the singularis the precuneus, cuneus, and lingualis gyri. The other craniometric point for parietal craniotomies is the eurion. The eurion is the craniometric point to be uh, that, uh, sorry, the eurion is the craniometric point that corresponds to the center of the parietal tuberosity. It is closely related to the superior temporal line and with a vertical line that passes through the posterior aspect of the mastoid tip and through the posterior limit of the escamous suture. The eurion was found to be over the superior aspect of the supramarginalis gyrus. The supramarginalis and the angular gyrus belong to the inferior parietal lobule and is separated from the superior by the intraparietal sulcus, as you can see in this picture. The supramarginalis gyrus posterior sulcus is the intermediary sulcus of Jensen, and it is the separation with the angular gyrus that is just posterior. It is usually continuous with the intraparietal sulcus. The supramarginalis is the most posterior point alo along the sylvian fissure, and the angular gyrus is the most posterior point of the superior temporal sulcus. Regarding possible surgical complication due, due two parietal approaches in the dominant hemisphere, language impairments can be related to the, the damage of these two gyri. The next point is the posterior temporal K point. The superior temporal sulcus constitute an important access to the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. Through its posterior portion, the ventricular atrium also can be approached. Normally, the posterior portion of the superior temporal gyrus lies underneath the posterior temporal point, 
This cranial site is located three centimeters vertically above the meeting point between the parietomastoid suture and the ascending ischemus suture. The posterior temporopoid was shown to be located just below the posterior aspect of the superior temporal line. The posterior temporal point was shown to be two or three centimeters posterior and inferior to the sylvian fissure. If we consider this finding, we must use the posterior temporal point for temporal posterior and inferior parietal craniotomies. This sulcal landmark is situated underneath the cranial site localized three centimeters vertically above the point between the horizontal parietomastoid suture and the posterior aspect of the escamoid suture. As you already know, the transtemporal posterior temporal approaches should be avoided in the dominant hemisphere because of their possible language impairments. The relation of the posterior temporal point with the lateral ventricle is shown <laughs> in these Osiris reconstructions. You can see deeper the ventricular atrium. Here I present a case of a 66 years old patient with headaches and dizziness during the last month. In the MRI, a tumor of this posterior path, part of the superior temporal gyrus was found. For the planning of the craniotomy, we used the posterior temporal key point. So we marked the site three centimeters superior to the transition point between the horizontal parietomastoid suture and the posterior aspect of the escamous suture. With that references, we made the temporal parietal craniotomy and exposes, exposed the cortical surface with the identification of the posterior part of the superior and middle temporal gyri. As we already know, there is no cortical exposure of the tumor, so we must be confident with our calculations. After the corticectomy in the most posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus, we found it the tumor less than one centimeter deep and removed completely. This is the vision after the removal of the tumor and the CT scan six hours after the operation. The patient went home with no neurosurgical deficits. And this is the last, the last one. The opistocranion is the craniometric point that corresponds to the most prominent occipital cranial point. It is in relation to the superior aspect of the calcarine fissure and with the base of the cuneus. The distance of the opistocranion to the occipital base is approximately two centimeters and indicates the height of the lingual gyrus, as you can see in green. The distance from the lambda to the opistocranion is between two and four centimeters and indicates the height of the cuneus. That is, maybe you can see in purple. Interhemispheric approaches through the occipital craniotomies done below the lambda usually have the advantage of dealing with fewer breaching veins than in the parietal craniotomies. This picture is very clear to show the relationship of the external occipital fissure with the parieto-occipital sulcus and the position of the opistocranion with the calcarine sulcus. It is interesting to know that along the occipital medial surface, the opistocranion, the distal half of the calcarine fissure, the isthmus of the cingulate gyrus and the splenium are roughly at the same level. Cortical visual impairments pertinent to these approaches are particularly related to the ma damage of the borders of the distal half of the calcarine sulcus. So, in, conclu in conclusion, all these gyral and sulcal K points can be very useful for initial intraoperative sulci identification and dissection. Altogether, they are an excellent framework for the hemispheric lesion localization, for the placement of the supratentorial craniotomies, as landmarks for transsulcus approaches to periventricular and ventricular lesion, and in the orientation for the anatomic removal of infiltrative tumor. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.